Aquatic Sciences Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Chung. Dr. Chung had his undergraduate degree at the University of Alberta and his medical school internal medicine and cardiology degrees at the University of British Columbia. He also completed a master's of public health and epidemiology at Harvard and the clinician investigator program also there. He has uh, lots of research interests that include atrial fibrillation, wearables, and digital health. And he is currently completing an advanced cardiac electrophysiology fellowship at the University of California in San Francisco, where he's been doing several uh, things with complex ablation, some clinical trials, and has been working in digital health. So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Chung with us today, and he's going to be touching on a topic that is very close and dear to me. So let's get on with it. Dr. Chung. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, Dr. Merlo. Uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today. Uh, really excited to be talking to you all about this topic, uh, atrial fibrillation in 2022, uh, new evidence and technologies in the detection and monitoring of atrial fibrillation. In terms of disclosures, I've received research funding from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, Bayer, as well as the Cardiac Rhythmic Society Network of Canada, uh, and serve on the advisory board of a, a Bay Area startup. And, and so briefly today, uh, we'll be going over uh, a broad topic of AF in 2022, primarily focusing on two categories, uh, the conventional monitoring of atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias, uh, touching on both intermediate duration and uh, implacable cardiac monitors. And then we'll also uh, speak uh, for the subsequent half on uh, wearable devices, uh, digital health, uh, and for AF detection and beyond. And we'll touch on both PPG devices, handheld ECGs, and some unanswered questions that I think are in this space. And so it goes without saying that AFib is the most common cardiac arrhythmia uh, with an estimated prevalence approximately uh, approximating 500,000 to 1 million Canadians. I think we also know that the prevalence of AFib increases with age, uh, and there are certainly some studies that show that the prevalence of AFib in those over 80 years of age approaches 10 to 20 percent. And what we also know is that AFib itself is associated with substantial morbidity and mortality. This is what we're all familiar with, that untreated AFib can be associated with hospitalization, uh, can be associated with stroke and systemic embolism. And this was a study that was published uh, perhaps 10 years ago was uh, looking at the costs associated with AFib and AFib related care. Uh, and this, in this Canadian study, uh, it showed that the cost of AFib and AFib related care approximates $800 million per year in Canada. Uh, and so I'm sure that's closer to $1 billion today. Uh, and that's important because we know that there are also very effective treatments for atrial fibrillation, uh, such as anticoagulation that can assist, assist, uh, uh, dramatically reduce the rate of stroke and systemic embolism in, in the range of 66 to 80 percent. And I think what's also really interesting uh, and exciting in this field is also that we also have new data. Uh, this was the East AFNET trial from uh, 2020. Uh, it was published and presented at the uh, European Society of Cardiology. And we have new evidence to suggest that early treatment of atrial fibrillation can be associated with improved outcomes, uh, including uh, reduced cardiovascular events, uh, such as death, uh, stroke, and rehospitalization. So, my, but, but of course, my rants today, we're not focusing on the treatment of atrial fibrillation, but more on the detection and monitoring of atrial fibrillation. So when I think about monitoring uh, and conventional monitoring devices, uh, we often think about what types of monitoring devices are available. And it goes without saying, but for atrial fibrillation and for any arrhythmia, the longer we monitor for patients, the more likely we are to pick up those arrhythmias. And so this, uh, this is something that applies across low risk and high risk populations. And there was a very nice study uh, that was published in 2009, looking at patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and pacemakers, uh, and essentially simulated the likelihood that you would pick up atrial fibrillation, depending on the type of monitoring device you use. So, so most, most basic is, our, of course, our single time point ECG. And so our single time point ECG, of course, only is a 10 second snapshot. Uh, and so you're very unlikely to pick up atrial fibrillation unless it's permanent or long setting persistent atrial fibrillation. And so here, the study simulated the sensitivity in the range of zero to 5%. Now, of course, we are all uh, familiar with, uh, with the Holter monitor uh, and it's a technology that we've had for over seven decades now. Uh, Holter monitor itself uh, provides for very reliable 24 hour monitoring. And so if we plot the Holter monitor onto our list, uh, we can increase our sensitivity of picking up atrial fibrillation uh, to around perhaps 30 to 40%. Uh, and so certainly the advantages of the Holter monitor include that it is a reliable technology that we're very familiar with. It generally produces pretty high quality data and has a relatively rapid turnaround time. 
But of course, the limitations of the conventional Holter monitor are that it limits ultimately only monitors generally for 24 to 48 hours, uh, and that can limit the yield of monitoring. And it's also a fairly bulky device itself, and that can impact compliance and, uh, and which in turn impacts yield of monitoring as well. So in the next uh, few slides, I'll talk more about what other options are available. And these are what I like to call the intermediate monitoring devices. Uh, and when I think of intermediate monitoring, there's you know, three broad categories. We have our event monitors and external loop recorders. Uh, we have our patch monitors that are um, really kind of uh, come to the forefront in the market in the past uh, five, 10 years and, and serve to replace a lot of these uh, external loop recorder devices. And then we have other devices like mobile cardiac telemetry, which is Primarily, it's the technology that's used in the states that allows for real-time um, streaming uh, and real-time response to, um, to ECG abnormality. So I won't really talk too much about that today. Uh, and so uh, for in terms of ex event monitors and external loop recorders, so these are devices that generally provide up to 30 days of monitoring. Uh, and some devices uh, can't uh, will only monitor um, if a patient triggers the recording, so those devices will miss a silent arrhythmia, whereas other devices have features that can auto record, uh, for example, atrial fibrillation, even if it's silent. Uh, and so it really depends on the population that you're monitoring uh, to make sure you choose the right uh, monitoring device. And so an example of, of how these monitoring devices were used, uh, the EMBRACE trial was a, a trial that looked at patients with a cryptogenic stroke uh, and no history of atrial fibrillation and randomized the uh, assignment of these patients into two groups uh, using an extended Cardiac, a 30 day cardiac monitor compared to a 24 hour monitor. Uh, and they use a device called the Braemar um, ER 910AF event monitor on the bottom right here. And patients also wore an uh, electrode belt uh, for a total of 30 days. And what Embrace nicely demonstrated in 2014 was that if you monitor intensively these 572 patients with a history of cryptogenic stroke and atrial fibrillation, or with no history of atrial fibrillation, sorry, you would detect a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation with event monitoring uh, at up to 16% at 90 days compared to 3% uh, in your standard, standard care arm uh, with a number needed to screen of eight. And they also nicely demonstrated on the graph on the right here that you also have a nice incremental increase in yield depending on how long you monitor for. So if you're, if you're using a conventional 24 hour monitor, you're going to detect AFib in perhaps 2% of patients. Uh, whereas if you increase your monitoring week by week, you can see a stepwise increase in your monitoring yield up to around 15% at four weeks. And so certainly an incremental increase in active uh, detection yield. And what they also showed was that these uh, patients were also more likely to be on uh, anticoagulation uh, with anticoagulation rates at 19% uh, compared to 11% in the uh, no monitoring group. So then we sought out to look at what other population is, could benefit from intensive monitoring, uh, and particularly with an external loop recorder. And this is another population I want to draw your attention to, uh, the myocardial infarction population, which of course we're all very familiar with. MI and AFib have certainly shared risk factors and AFib often con occurs concurrently with MI. AFib patients can present with MI and similarly, um, patients that present with MI may have AFib diagnosed at the time they present to hospital. Uh, but what's also um, known is, or what's also present is that arrhythmia care after an MI is somewhat um, uh, at the discretion of the primary cardiologist or physician. There's no systematic type of ECG follow-up that we do um, apart from intermittent ECGs and Holter monitors. And perhaps that there is an opportunity there to monitor patients more intensively um, uh, for, uh, for arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. And so there was on the bottom right here, there was a cohort study that was uh, published uh, most um, 10 years ago now uh, that looked at routine use of implantable cardiac monitors in uh, patients with uh, MI that had an EF of less than 40%. And uh, in this study, this is called, was called the CHARISMA study. Uh, they showed that you would detect a higher rate of atrial fibrillation or a high rate. Uh, and also that new onset AFib uh, was associated with uh, adverse, cardi uh, cardi adver adverse cardiovascular events. Uh, so that's the purple line here. Uh, you can see here that they had a hazard ratio of 2.7. Uh, for adverse cardiovascular events and follow-up. So perhaps this MI occurring after AFib is a higher risk subgroup that we should be looking for uh, more closely. And, and so that is certainly that we, something that, we've note, uh, that we sought to investigate uh, in a randomized trial. Uh, so this was a randomized trial that we ran in Vancouver uh, called the SIMPLE AF study. Uh, and SIMPLE AF stands for Standard Versus Intensive Monitoring Post Myocardial Infarction Looking for New Onset AFib. Uh, and it was a randomized trial where we compared uh, intensive monitoring versus standard of care after a myocardial infarction. Uh, 
uh, with our primary, with our hypothesis being that, of course, intensive monitoring using an external 30-day cardiac monitor will detect more new onset AFib and flutter compared to standard of care. Uh, and this was something that was not done before because, you know, the prior studies were cohort studies that looked at using implantable cardiac monitors, but of course, routine use of an ILR or an ICM is not exactly economically feasible. Uh, and so, you know, we, we thought to, to study this using an external cardiac monitor. And so briefly, our study design primarily looked at including all patients that presented to the uh, cor uh, coronary care unit and cardiac intensive care unit in Vancouver with a myocardial infarction and no history of atrial fibrillation. Uh, we excluded patients that were going to undergo cardiac surgery or had known atrial fibrillation in the past. Our intervention group was the intensive monitoring arm where patients wore a 30-day external loop recorder. Uh, and our standard of care or control group uh, was uh, those that had um, was, was simply ECG uh, or Holter monitoring at the discretion of the primary physician. And then we looked for a primary outcome of new onset AFib or flutter uh, that we detected at 30 days um, of follow-up. But we also did look at secondary outcomes, including other arrhythmias, such as um, VT, pauses, uh, and adverse events uh, at one year. And so this is uh, just like a concert diagram to show how uh, we enrolled and screened for these patients. So. And uh, you can see between 2017 and 2020, we screened approximately 2,000 patients that presented with uh, MI uh, to the CCU or CICU. And it, among these, among this group, we ultimately consented uh, approximately 100, uh, we have consented 195. We had actually powered our study for 240, but we were able to, uh, had ended the study early, um, uh, which I'll talk to you and talk about in a bit. Uh, but in the, among the 195 patients, we were able to randomize them in a two-to-one fashion to intensive monitoring uh, using a, a spider flash ex uh, external loop recorder. A spider flash external loop recorder uh, was a nice device that we used. It's an external cardiac monitor that essentially um, was taught and hooked up to patients before they left hospital, and patients were asked to return the device at the end of the monitoring period. And we liked the device because there is a customizable AFib detection algorithm, and that the stroke neurologists uh, locally were already using the device, so we had good workflows. Uh, to interpret the data. Uh, and then the other 65 individuals were randomized to standard of care, which was again, ECGs at the primary discretion of the uh, primary physician. Uh, and then we looked for new, uh, new, new AFib and atrial flutter events that we defined as 30 seconds or longer, uh, or 10 seconds on an ECG at follow-up. And so these are just some of our, our findings. Um, I'll skip through these a little bit quickly, but Generally, the baseline characteristics of this cohort reflected the typical population that we see uh, in the CCU, uh, mean age of 63 years, 77% male, BMI of 27.8, mean CHADS VAS score of 3.4 points. And similarly, the hospitalization features, uh, these are were mostly STEMI patients, 68%, and then one-third N-STEMI patients. And, and most patients underwent uh, coronary angiography and PCI, mainly because that was our definition or enrollment criteria was that uh, we excluded patients with uh, non atherosclerotic coronary disease and excluded patients with, uh, with uh, plans to undergo cardiac surgery. And then we monitored these patients for, uh, for, uh, for uh, we, we tried to monitor these patients for 30 days. Uh, in the end, patients were monitored for a median time of 20 days uh, with an interportal range between 15 and 22 days. And this was certainly something that was primarily limited by our battery life of the device uh, in the end. Uh, so that certainly became a limitation in this study. And we also did encounter some type of monitoring issue uh, in 18 patients with some patients not returning their device uh, and some patients having a sort of device malfunction. Uh, and so this was our primary outcome. So we'll, I'll be presenting these uh, results actually in a, in a few days time at the ACC Young Investigator. Uh, but this is a snapshot of our results is to show that uh, we essentially detected a new, a uh, higher rate of new onset atrial fibrillation or flutter uh, in our intensive monitoring strategy, uh, as shown in the red here. Uh, we were able to show that intensive monitoring detected more AFib in 10 patients compared to zero patients in the standard of care group. Uh, and so uh, we were, at, we were, had a log rank p value of 0 0.023, which met our early termination boundary, and we were, we were able to terminate our trial early uh, before needing the complete enrollment. Uh, and then we also had a per protocol analysis that showed a p value of 0 0.018. Uh, and just briefly, uh, among these 10 patients, uh, AFib was detected either by the device alone uh, in eight of them, uh, by both device and ECG uh, uh, in one patient, and then by ECG alone, but in the intensive care, intensive monitoring arm uh, in one patient. But what I think is also very important to highlight is that among these 10 episodes of atrial fibrillation, only 40% of them, or four out of 10 episodes, 
actually led to some significant change in treatment uh, strategy, such as the prescription of anticoagulation uh, or treat other treatments such as catheter ablation. And so what, what, we think, I, what I think we know now about atrial fibrillation post-MI is that in, our, in this prospective randomized trial, we're able to show intensive monitoring using a, uh, using a reusable 30-day external loop recorder is able to detect a significantly higher rate of new onset atrial fibrillation or flutter compared to standard of care alone. And again, we demonstrated this both in our intention to treat and per protocol analyses, uh, but the clinical significance of the AFib that we detect in this post-MI period still remains unclear. And the majority of these episodes were not deemed clinically significant uh, uh, with resulting in no changes to the treatment of these patients. And now returning a little bit back to the monitoring discussion and monitoring devices. So those were a couple examples of studies that, that, uh, that have been done using uh, external loop recorders, the EMBRACE and our simple AF trial. Uh, moving on to the next type of devices are our patch monitors. And these patch monitors have generally become available in the past decade uh, and have been available through a number of commercial um, partners. Uh, so for example, the patch monitors provide for 7 to 30 days of continuous monitoring and are available through um, iRhythm, which is uh, uh, iRhythm Dial Patch, which is uh, actually launched here uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I sent the Cardiostat, which is a device uh, based in, uh, uh, that was launched in Quebec, uh, and the uh, Bardi DX Carnation Ambulatory Monitor, which was uh, invented by uh, Gus Bardi. And, and all of these devices are, are meant to be very easy to use. They can be stuck on um, often by the patient themselves, and provide for uh, this 30 days of continuous monitoring. And there are certainly a number of institutions that show that we can now use these devices essentially completely in lieu of Holter monitors and have replaced Holter monitors in some institutions. Uh, and so this is just an example of how, you know, in post-stroke uh, post TIA workup, when you, again, monitor with a patch monitor, you detect a significantly higher rate of atrial fibrillation um, in follow-up compared to just like a standard 24 or 48 Holter monitor alone. And so a large body of evidence now really supporting the use of extended monitoring devices and really what I think we should be using uh, moving forward. So, you know, just an example in, in syncope evaluation, we know that a prolonged monitoring um, certainly has benefits for a syncope evaluation and identifying uh, the cause of syncope. Um, cryptogenic stroke, as I mentioned earlier, and, and things like the EMBRACE trial. Um, we did a similar study where we looked at patch monitoring in inherited arrhythmia patients and looked at whether we could correlate ECG uh, QT interval uh, measurements, and, and that certainly is uh, can be correlated across monitoring devices as well. And so in turn, to summarize, this the, the, these uh, devices, these intermediate monitoring devices, now when we add them to our graph here by, uh, by Boto et al. Uh, from 2009, you can see here now our sensitivity of picking up paroxysmal atrial fibrillation increases to 60 or 70%. Uh, and certainly the advantages are the prolonged monitoring with these devices. And often some of these devices have an intermediate cost like the reusable uh, external loop recorder that we had. Uh, although patch monitors themselves are generally more uh, disposable and, and sent back to the company. Uh, and some of the disadvantages of these devices, um, event monitors can mo may miss silent arrhythmias if you choose a device that does not detect silent arrhythmias. Uh, and other devices may still be bulky like the external loop recorder and that can in, in turn limit uh, patient compliance and monitoring yields. And then lastly, the patch monitors are, are very, uh, very more, much more patient friendly, but generally these devices are sent back to the manufacturer for analysis. And so there's less information available in terms of getting a full disclosure report and, and getting all the monitoring data. All right, so moving on uh, in terms of our, uh, the next topic uh, is uh, looking at implantable cardiac monitors and how we can use these for AFib detection and care. And so implantable cardiac monitors, I think we're all fairly familiar with now. These are now injectable devices that can be done in the office and uh, have been made by each of the various companies, uh, device companies, and provide for patient-triggered event monitoring and, uh, and, uh, and automatic detection uh, algorithms. Uh, most of these devices are compatible with remote monitoring uh, and often have a smartphone app that can be paired with them to uh, help patients use the device and, and can generally decrease the time uh, to the diagnosis of arrhythmias. And so just to show a couple of studies that have used implantable cardiac monitors, uh, the CRYSTAL AF trial um, looked at, uh, this, it's certainly been used in a variety of populations, and the CRYSTAL AF trial was one that looked to validate this use in cryptogenic stroke patients. And so again, very similar to EMBRACE, patients were randomized to either intensive monitoring now using an implantable cardiac monitor versus control, uh, and they were able to detect a significantly higher rate of uh, new onset AFib in, this, in these patients with a hazard ratio of 8.8. .8. And similarly, two other trials looking at, or two other studies looking at high-risk cohorts uh, include the include the ASSERT-2 uh, study, uh, which was by Dr. Jeff Healy in, in Hamilton. And ASSERT-2 essentially looked at patients that have 
um, risk factors for stroke and showed that when you implant a cardiac monitor in these patients with a risk factor uh, for stroke, you can detect this new phenomenon of subclinical atrial fibrillation uh, as in, as in up to 34% of patients at 18 months. Uh, and then similarly, the Reveal AF trial was in, or Reveal AF study was another study looking at empiric use of implantable cardiac monitors in high risk patients, and again showed up to 40% subclinical atrial fibrillation uh, in, uh, at 30 months. Now, using our implantable cardiac monitors also extends beyond just the diagnosis, uh, diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. We can also potentially use implantable cardiac monitors to better evaluate and classify patients with known atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so this was a nice uh, example of a study. Uh, uh, this was a nice uh, publication by Dr. Andrade that looked at how we can use implantable cardiac monitors to differentiate how we classify patients when they're going for uh, atrial fibrillation, for example. So uh, in the circuit dose and randomized trial, all patients had an implantable cardiac monitor uh, placed at least one month prior to, uh, prior to their ablation. And you can see here that uh, patients were classified into either, whether they had low burden, high burden, or persistent AFib based on the clinician uh, and then based on the device. Uh, and so of course the device is going to be the gold standard where you have a very high um, dichotomization between the three groups. And then you can see that there's significant overlap between the clinician definition of what is low burden versus what is high burden atrial fibrillation. And this is relevant because when we look at the post-ablation outcomes, the clinical classification is not really able to stratify patients for their outcomes, uh, especially between those low burden and high burden paroxysmal AFib groups. Whereas if we use a device to classify these patients, we're much better able to classify their outcomes in terms of their risk for recurrent arrhythmia. So I think we can use an implantable cardiac monitor to potentially help um, tailor, patient, uh, tailor patient treatment and uh, estimate their risk of recurrence. So to briefly summarize, implantable cardiac monitors generally provide for ultra long duration monitoring. I, I think of these as providing now a near continuous uh, cardiac monitoring, of course, uh, and uh, essentially can monitor for patients that have very infrequent symptoms. They can also generate a new metric that has uh, of AFib burden, and perhaps AFib burden is a better outcome um, or a better marker of success after a catheter ablation, for example, compared to um, the dichotomy of uh, whether they had a recurrence or not. And then similar, you have, you, we have benefits related to remote monitoring. Uh, but at the same time, implantable cardiac monitors have disadvantages in that they are semi-invasive. Uh, and of course, they have a very expensive cost associated with them. So I don't think we can necessarily be using them in all our patients um, moving forward and that there, are, uh, there is an opportunity for uh, other new devices. And then lastly, uh, which I can't spend too much time on, is, that, is the specificity of these, uh, is the, uh, the specificity of the arrhythmias detected by these monitoring devices. Um, these implantable cardiac monitors, because we're monitoring so continuously, we now generate a wealth of health data uh, and the specificity of these atrial high rate episodes uh, is generally less. Uh, and we also are detecting now these subclinical atrial fibrillation episodes that may be of uh, unclear significance. So now I want to change gears a little bit for the second half of my talk and now focusing a little bit on the use of wearable devices and digital health and how we can use them for AF detection itself and, and beyond. And so it goes uh, without, uh, without saying that wearable devices, we've seen an explosion in this field in the past uh, one to two decades. Uh, these are essentially smart electronic devices that can provide for uh, physiological monitoring, activity tracking, and more. And so I I've listed all the parameters that can be measured here, uh, but I, I'm sure there are more now. Um, so heart rate, heart rate variability, um, oxygen saturation, uh, arrhythmia detection, um, sleep patterns, uh, and more. And, and generally, uh, there's a, an emergent field, field to show that we can use these devices for arrhythmia detection. And, and numerous uh, studies have showed that we can use smartwatches effectively for AFib detection. And I think before I get to the evidence for that, I think what's really exciting about using wearable devices for arrhythmia detection is that I think uh, wearable devices really come close to approximating that continuous monitor. If we think back to that uh, photo at Alec graph, uh, it, wearable devices essentially provide for near continuous monitoring. And so by monitoring these patients almost or participants almost continuously, you can really generate a huge amount of health data and really increase your monitoring yield uh, with wearable devices. And so when, I, when, we, when we talk about wearable devices, there are generally a few um, types of monitoring that are performed. And so first of all, uh, are our PPG devices. And so PPG is, what's, is the technology that most smartphones will use to measure heart rate. And so PPG is, of course, similar to our oxygen saturation probe. It's photoplasmography, and it looks for the change in color um, with each pulse. 
uh, and and the uh, and the wearable devices can plot a graph of your PPG, uh, and then it can look at the irregularities in the PPG to predict when you may be having an arrhythmia. Uh, and a lot of Wii wearables will also have an accelerometer to measure your physical activity, and then can correlate your PPG with your simultaneous accelerometer to see if it's appropriate or, or inappropriate. Now, what's relevant is that these devices only measure heart rate generally intermittently, uh, and that can be every three to five minutes. But a lot of these devices can be programmed into, an, into a workout mode to sample your heart rate more frequently. So uh, as frequently as generally every three to five seconds. And so how can we use this to detect atrial fibrillation? So this is an example of um, a patient that had a Garmin smartwatch and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And you can see how we can use it we can use the PPG just alone to, to predict when this patient goes into atrial fibrillation. On the left here is when uh, this patient goes for a run um, where, with his smartwatch, and you can see he has a nice increase in plateau in his heart rate with exercise, um, not much variability. Uh, whereas when this patient goes into atrial fibrillation, you can see just the significant variability in his peak heart rate. His peak heart rate, in fact, is much higher in AFib as well. And this irregularity really suggests that he is in, a, in an arrhythmia uh, and in AFib. Uh, so of course, this concept is not new. This has been tested uh, now uh, for uh, a number of studies in the past uh, five, 10 years, looking at using specifically the PPG recording to detect atrial fibrillation. Uh, one study that, that I thought was really nice was actually a local UCSF study that looked at 50 patients that were undergoing cardioversion for AFib. So they had known AFib and they were asked to wear a smartwatch during the entire cardioversion period. And so the PPG was recorded. And then they created a neural network, uh, a machine learning algorithm that can essentially differentiate between what was AFib and what was sinus rhythm. And you can see here in the cardioversion cohort, they were able to, to, to do this with very high uh, specificity and sensitivity. Uh, and then even when they validated this on an external cohort that uh, you can see that it, it performed, this neural network ended up performing very well. Uh, and so, it, of course, I think it's any talk on wearables, we'll, we need to focus on all the wearable devices that we have out there. So just want to take a few minutes to cover what types of uh, algorithms and what types of features are available on these commercial smartwatches that we use, um, that we all use these days. And so for an example, uh, the Apple Watch study, which is probably the most commonly used as smartwatch, generally has two types of uh, notifications. Uh, there's a high heart rate notification on the Apple Watch, which uh, correlates your in, uh, your simultaneous heart rate with your accelerometer or gyroscope, uh, kind of kind of what I mentioned earlier, and can tell you if you're unexpectedly, you have an unexpectedly high heart rate during a period of physical inactivity. Uh, and then there's the irregular rhythm notification that looks at that, again, that irregularity in the PPG interval. And once you have enough prompts of irregularity, it can prompt you to record an ECG or, or prompt you that you have an irregular heart rhythm. And so this second, this latter uh, notification was tested in the Apple Heart Study. Uh, so the Apple Heart Study was published by the Stanford Group uh, back in 2019 and uh, was impress impressively enrolled almost 420,000 participants over eight months uh, and monitored these uh, individuals for 117 days. And essentially, once participants had irregular, they called them tachograms, but once they had enough irregular tachograms, uh, this triggered a notification to tell the patient that you may have atrial fibrillation uh, and patients were sent a patch monitor uh, to look for atrial fibrillation. And so what they showed in this study was that among this huge cohort, about 0.5% or 2,000 participants ultimately had the irregular rhythm notification, but only, only a very small number ended up actually completing the patch monitoring um, 450 patients. Uh, and and in, in the end here, only a small fraction of patients ended up being diagnosed, uh, were ultimately diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. 34% um, had AFib among those 450 that actually did the patch monitor. Uh, but they were still able, able to show that the positive predictive value for an irregular not rhythm notification on the Apple Watch was associated with a positive predictive value of 84%. And I think this graph uh, that they have in their, man their manuscript is very telling uh, because it really highlights um, the findings, but also some of the challenges that we have with these, some of these wearable devices. So we can see here as our age increase, as age increases, the risk of developing AFib increases substantially. Uh, and in those age over 65, those were the ones that had the highest likelihood of uh, detecting new, uh, new atrial fibrillation and an irregular rhythm notification. But then at the same time, our lowest, uh, our youngest population, those between 22 and 39 years of age, had the lowest risk. But these are the individuals that comprise of more than half of the study. So I think that's really going to be the challenge with these wearable devices is that the, 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 age, uh, the age of participants or the age of users is going to be very discrepant from the, um, from the bulk of risk factors uh, uh, of, those, uh, of these arrhythmias. Uh, 
And what's also important is that wearable device, uh, these devices are not necessarily a panacea. Uh, so this is an example of the Apple Watch where um, 50 patients uh, undergoing cardiac surgery uh, that wore the Apple Watch post-operatively and had continuous uh, telemetry at the same time. And here they showed that when you had that uh, Apple Watch, the Apple Watch notifications themselves were not very uh, not very sensitive uh, in picking up atrial fibrillation. A lot of a lot of re readings from the Apple Watch were also inconclusive, uh, and so having a physician manually interpret these uh, as an overread was was certainly more specific. So not not a panacea uh, for uh, for uh, AFib detection. Uh, and then also there are also additional algorithms that are available for uh, detecting. Uh, detecting AFib, and, and this is just a couple algorithms that, that, are, that I think are very interesting. Um, these, a lot of these algorithms use machine learning and neural networks to recognize AFib. Um, a, the Alive Core Smart Rhythm uh, is actually not available in, anymore, but was previously available with the Cardia Band that Alive Core also makes. Uh, essentially would look at your heart rate PPG trend and would plot like a 95% confidence interval um, based on their machine learning model and could essentially could tell you when your heart rate was out of, the, out of range compared to usual based on the predicted model. And then at that time would recommend you do an ECG. And so that's certainly a, an interesting feature as well. But that being said though, I think it's important to highlight that most of these continuous, these devices that we call continuous monitoring may not necessarily be continuous monitoring. They, the Apple Watch, for example, only provides for intermittent heart rhythm assessments. Again, maybe every three to five minutes uh, when you're wearing it or when you're, in, when you're doing a workout or in workout mode, maybe every three to five seconds. Uh, and so, uh, and the regular rhythm notification specifically on the Apple Watch itself only runs for one minute every two hours. And that itself can account for maybe 12 minutes of monitoring per day. And that can certainly fail to identify patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation if you don't have true continuous monitoring and you only have this type of intermittent sampling. Uh, so this was something that was uh, investigated by uh, another UCSF study um, uh, by Dr. Ro uh, Robert Abram and Jeff Tison in his group here at UCSF, and they published this last year and heart rhythm, where they looked at the Samsung watch now. And what was different about this study was that they were able to customize the Samsung watch to provide for continuous PPG monitoring, um, so without interruption. Uh, and, and they got essentially 207 patients to wear the Samsung watch and wear a single lead uh, uh, continuous ECG patch uh, for four weeks. And these are their results. They, they essentially showed that uh, you, when you have these AFib notification algorithms on the Samsung watch, the more AFib notification algorithms, the more accurate your diagnosis will be, the higher the specificity. Uh, but what else, it was also, I think, very exciting and very interesting is that now when you start monitoring with a wearable device continuously, you can also start to generate this new metric of AFib burden, which we're starting to become more familiar with uh, in the ablation space. Uh, and so all of a sudden you can generate this AFib burden measurement. And that, I think, certainly opens up a large number of opportunities um, to study how we can use smartwatch data to uh, improve care uh, in, uh, in AFib patients. And now just, uh, just to touch briefly on another study, uh, this was uh, the Huawei Heart Study that looked at uh, the uh, Huawei uh, smartphone and Huawei Watch uh, and was published uh, back in 2019. Uh, and in a, a similar finding where uh, the major, uh, they recruited a, quite a large screening population, but in the end, only a very small number had, uh, had a suspected AFib. Uh, and in the Huawei Heart, they were able to plug these patients into a, um, into a hospital and an AFib pathway. Uh, and they showed that the positive predictive value for the signals themselves was 92%. Um, but one of the limitations of the study uh, was that they actually reported it again based on the signals themselves. And when you break that down to actually based on the patients themselves, um, then the positive predictive value uh, of getting a PPG, uh, of getting an irregular rhythm um, abnormality was much lower. Um, so an important uh, caveat to the interpretation of the Huawei Heart Study. And so to summarize some of the limitations that exist with these uh, wearable devices, these devices essentially pro uh, provide for uh, very good monitoring. But at the same time, the, uh, what I mentioned earlier is that generally wearable device use uh, in blue here tracks inversely with uh, AFib prevalence, which goes up with time. Uh, and so certainly uh, there's potentially less applicability or generalizability um, for studies that show an accurate device in the young may not necessarily be uh, as useful in the elderly. And then we also have this uh, elephant in the room is that what is the clinical relevance of these uh, wearable device detected arrhythmias? That, of course, is still very unclear. Uh, and now in the last few minutes, I'll talk more about how we can use handheld ECGs uh, and other digital health tools as well um, for the diagnosis. So, of course, many of these devices, apart from the PPG monitor itself, now have a 
ECG uh, or can provide for a single lead ECG. And so thinking about devices like the Apple Watch um, or the Alive Core Cardia allow the patient to record a single lead ECG. The Alive Core can actually record a six lead ECG as well now. And both of these uh, can send the ECG for uh, automated interpretation and analysis. And so this was a nice figure uh, from a recent review that summarizes what we can, what a lot of these wearable devices can do and how they are used. Uh, so for example, the Cardia Mobile from Alive Core uh, and the Apple Watch both record a single lead ECG using primarily the lead one um, reference uh, with a right arm, left arm. And then we have the Alive Core Cardia that uh, uses a six lead ECG, uh, including, the, in, including the left leg. We have other devices available like uh, the Koala, uh, uh, which is a device that can be, just be placed on the chest that uh, essentially measures a, a percordal ECG uh, from that point. Uh, and then devices that I mentioned earlier um, that in this review, they, they classified them as wearables because these patch monitors are essentially very wearable. Um, the Bardi DX coordination ambulatory monitor, which hangs down the center of the sternum uh, and is meant for AFib detection. And then things like the iRhythm Zeo patch or uh, the Biotel MCOT device are all patches that can be worn on the chest as well. And, and what we know is that we can use these devices generally pretty effectively. Uh, and so this was a summary of various cohorts uh, that have used wearable device handheld ECGs to screen for and detect atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so you can see in various populations in the United States, uh, in the uh, Netherlands, uh, Sweden, uh, UK, uh, and Canada, of course, as well, uh, we can show that we can use these devices to detect a high rate of atrial fibrillation anywhere from 1.6% to 7%. And so um, certainly a good option if you're looking for opportunistic screening in the, in the clinic uh, to use a handheld ECG as a way to detect atrial fibrillation and screen for AFib. But, and there are also some suggestions that, we can, that you can use these devices to detect more than just atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so this was a study that looked at the emergency department and looked at 100 patients coming to the emergency department and looked at how we can use the wearable device to measure QT interval. Uh, and so they placed uh, the Apple Watch in the lead one, um, the typical vector. Uh, and you can see here that the QT interval was sometimes not very good. But then when they placed the Apple Watch in different uh, vectors, uh, you know, on the leg uh, or, on, um, or on the chest, uh, they were able to detect a much more uh, reliable QT interval uh, in this study. Um, so I think what that highlights is that perhaps we can use these in studies in expanded population, but there still needs to be a lot of research done uh, in terms of how we can use these um, multi-lead uh, handheld ECGs for uh, detecting things other than, uh, other than AFib alone. Uh, and this was another study that was actually just published uh, this month in, in Europace. Uh, that looked at uh, volunteers that had either uh, Brugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, uh, pre-excitation, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or ARBC, uh, and looked at, again, how we can use smartwatch ECGs to detect some of these uh, ECG abnormalities uh, that we typically would, uh, or previously would use a 12-lead ECG to detect. Um, so certainly very interesting. And, and again, they show that you do really require a multi-lead ECG, but perhaps that multi-lead ECG is achievable uh, with a wearable device. Uh, and this, uh, this figure summarizes really how when you choose your monitoring device, you're balancing in the end the number of leads that you're recording. Uh, when you're choosing this uh, ECG, you're balancing the monitoring duration. Uh, you're balancing things like portability uh, and, and, and duration of monitoring, and you're balancing the diagnostic value with the number of ECGs that you're recording uh, on that device. And, and so to summarize, I, I think this is a nice summary to a, a nice slide that summarizes how accurate we can use these devices. Most of these devices are generally validated for AFib detection and monitoring. Um, but that being said, it's important to know that every device on its own has slightly different sensitivities and specificities. Uh, so this nicely summarizes our PPG wearable devices and then our ECG wearable devices in terms of, in terms of their sensitivity and specificity for picking up atrial fibrillation. And, and that's where the uh, bulk of the data is, is that we can use these devices probably as a surrogate in most patients for AFib detection and monitoring, but not necessarily in all. And certainly we should avoid at this point, I think, avoid over-interpretation of some of these results, especially if you're only getting a single lead ECG recording. So not over-interpreting the QT interval um, or things like ST elevation uh, would not be accurate at all. And then lastly, I want to take a couple minutes just to talk briefly on some, I think, unanswered questions and opportunities that exist in the digital health space. Uh, and so one question I, uh, that is often brought up is how do we interpret these arrhythmias that, are, uh, that a patient brings in on their wearable device? And so this is just a bit of a schematic that I, that I thought about in terms of how you would interpret some of this health data. Uh, and so for example, a patient may present with a wearable detected arrhythmia. And I think whenever possible, we should review the ECG strips. Uh, 
And then the big question is whether this is an intentional or an incidental finding, because I think if it's intentional, I think there's enough justification and evidence there that an intentional finding of atrial fibrillation, so someone that has palpitations or, uh, or theoretically maybe even has a cryptogenic stroke and detects new AFib on their wearable device, I think that's good enough to say that that is true atrial fibrillation and that we should risk stratify and treat those patients accordingly. Whereas if you have someone that has incidental atrial fibrillation, this is where it gets a lot more murky and there's some role for risk stratification, looking at AFib and stroke risk factors and if, positive, if uh, present, then doing the confirmatory testing uh, and then risk stratifying at that point. And then if negative, this is an otherwise healthy um, a worried well individual, for example, um, then I think there's role for AFib education and, and reassurance of these patients and, and interval follow-up. But what this is missing is that there are a lot of unanswered questions all along this entire pathway in terms of what, how do we interpret this data and how accurate is all this data and what are the pathways that we have in place? So, you know, just an example, like how, which devices should we be using? Which ones are the most accurate? How do we store the data in our health system or, or on the patient's health record? Uh, what, what, what about systematic versus opportunistic screening? Uh, and then when, uh, when you have an AFib uh, detected on the device, you know, what, what if the wearable device AFib cannot be confirmed on an ECG? How do we follow those patients? And what's our threshold in the end for treatment of wearable detected AFib? Is it the same as our other monitoring devices or is it different? Uh, and so a lot of unanswered questions I think uh, exist uh, in this field to date. Uh, and lastly, I just want to take a couple more minutes and talk about, uh, I, uh, because I focus most of this talk on wearable devices, but there certainly is an entire field of digital health that extends beyond this. And so digital health ex extends beyond wearable devices and includes use of mobile apps and novel data sources as a way to uh, uh, improve AFib-related care. And so and ex as an example, uh, here at UCSF, we have a platform called the Eureka platform that essentially is an online um, an uh, online uh, patient, patient, patient management platform that can allow for uh, and support uh, digital health studies, uh, incorporates remote monitoring and, uh, and devices, uh, and essentially facilitates what uh, we envision in the future as a remote decentralized clinical trial. Uh, and so just as one example of something that you can do with, you know, with a digital health platform or smartphone app is that uh, this was a study that was run uh, by Dr. Marcus here uh, at UCSF, and, and it's essentially looked at how we can use a mobile app to help Tailor patient tailor the identification of AFib triggers. Um, so Dr. Marcus uh, presented this uh, 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 presented this last year at AHA. Uh, it was the iStop AFib study uh, and essentially looked at using uh, the smartphone app to help patients test triggers for atrial fibrillation. And so they were able to identify, for example, alcohol as a trigger for atrial fibrillation um, using this study. And, and certainly a lot of other opportunities in using digital health studies, uh, leveraging this Eureka platform and leveraging the healthy heart cohort um, that they have here at UCSF. Uh, and just an example of one of the many, the many studies that you can look at um, using a novel digital health platform. And so to conclude, I, I think ho hopefully what I've shown here today is that these advances in our monitoring devices uh, over the past decade have uh, resulted in substantial changes to how we detect um, atrial fibrillation and Really, uh, AFib is being increasingly detected on uh, implantable cardiac monitors and also wearable devices, and we need to have uh, a way to manage uh, all this atrial fibrillation as well. Uh, there are increasing opportunities for arrhythmic and uh, AFib detection using wearable devices, but at the same time, interpretation of these arrhythmias uh, requires consideration of many factors, including the type of monitoring that we're doing, is it PPG or ECG recordings, uh, the device specific device type that we're using in terms of the specific sensitivities and specificities with that device, and then various patient factors as well, the risk factors for the patient for developing atrial fibrillation or their risk factors for stroke. And then in, in addition to our wearable devices, we have many novel digital health tools that now can provide a new dimension uh, for healthcare and uh, for clinical trials and studies. And, and I think, as I mentioned in, that, in my flowchart earlier, that there are really many opportunities and unanswered questions uh, for using wearables and digital health uh, in, in our in arrhythmia management, and we need to better understand how we can leverage these technologies to improve the care of our patients uh, living with AFib and other arrhythmias. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I just want to recognize um, all, all my mentors that have supported me over the years uh, at UCSF and also at UBC, and as well as the funding, uh, funding support that I've received for the past year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. That was a very comprehensive overview of a complicated topic. And uh, I'm sure there's uh, tons of questions. Now, let me start with one, you know, there's, I think there's an area where the technology is a little bit ahead of uh, our understanding of the evidence, and even the pathophysiology of a lot of these issues. 
So just for example, in an area like, let's say, uh, cryptogenic stroke, you know, the studies in cryptogenic stroke that have randomized people to oral anticoagulation have both been negative. So uh, poses the question of, so really, who cares about detecting atrial fibrillation, you know, 12 months or 36 months like we did in, in, in crystal AF? So who cares if anticoagulating these people doesn't make much of a difference? And actually, what is actually shown that made a difference is people that have left atrial remodeling, you know, left atrial size greater than X was probably the only predictor that identified this population. So why are we so concerned about detecting atrial fibrillation 30 <laughs> seconds? What does that mean? When <laughs> yeah. our sub-studies from ACERT, which is a different population, shown that really more than 24 hours that we should be concerned, at least in that population. So convince me that we should continue this path. <laughs> that, hey, that's, that's, a, that's a great question and, and a tough one, Dr. Murillo. I mean, I think you essentially hit it on his head that, you know, there's still, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in this space. Um, like you said earlier, that uh, you know, atrial fibrillation of, of very short duration is of, of, of unclear significance. And I think we also highlighted that in our simple AF trial where, you know, if you have a very short episode of atrial fibrillation, you, it, it's unclear whether that actually is associated with outcomes. I think there probably is a, some a level in which AFib becomes significant, and that probably varies by disease state. Um, so, for example, in the cryptogenic stroke population that you mentioned, it's interesting that there, certainly there have been no randomized trials that show that empiric anticoagulation, for example, after cryptogenic stroke um, will, will reduce outcomes. But I think if you showed most neurologists the finding of, a crypt, uh, of an AFib detected after a cryptogenic stroke on an external loop recorder, most neurologists would consider that clinically significant atrial fibrillation and probably would anticoagulate those patients. So I think it depends on each disease state that we're looking at. And then uh, then the subsequent population would be their subclinical AFib population in pace with pacemakers. As you mentioned in a cert, there was the analysis looking at the duration of AFib and whether or not anticoagulating those patients would be beneficial. And I think the jury is still out. Um, certainly the Van Gelder analysis suggested that AFib longer than 24 hours, yes, that is associated with a much higher stroke rate and those patients probably should be anticoagulated. But even in those that are you know, five, six minutes to up to 24 hours, that jury is still out in that, you know, that's still being studied in randomized trials like Artesia and, and NOAA AFNet and, and whether that is actually warrants anticoagulating. So I, or it's anticoagulation. So I think there's actually a lot of opportunity for study in this area, and we need to think about what are what are the best studies that we can run. Uh, on, on top of that, it, it might also be that it's not necessarily anticoagulation that is the treatment for some of these patients. You know, one of our hypotheses going into simple AF was that not necessarily these patients would be anticoagulated because they have, you know, they have an MI and already are on DAPT, um, and, and so may, prescription physicians may not necessarily prescribe anticoagulation, but there may be other findings that these patients may themselves just be at higher risk for developing subsequent events. So, you know, AFib may be an early marker of having a hospitalization or AFib may be an early marker of developing adverse cardiovascular events and that it just identifies a higher risk population that we should be following more closely. Uh, and so I think there, there are different ways that we should approach this population and certainly anticoagulation is, uh, is one of them. Dr. Wilton has a question. Hi, good morning, uh, Chris. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I've had a chance to use a lot of these devices, mostly not available for routine care, but in lots of clinical trials that we do, both the, you know, some of the patch monitors and the insertable monitors, and all of them have issues with specificity, um, as you know, I'm sure too. Um, and given the high volume of tracings that are there, this is a major issue, you know, if we start rolling this out more broadly. So is there hope on the horizon in terms of AI or other ways of managing this huge volume and making sure that when we call AF, it doesn't require an electrophysiologist to verify it every single time? <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Wilson. That's a good question. Uh, and absolutely. I, I mean, I think there uh, that we definitely need to develop these systems uh, that are going to help manage this huge volume of health data. Uh, I think uh, whether we like it or not, I think this uh, this impending huge volume of health data is coming. And so we have to respond and really develop the systems that will manage uh, this volume of health data. I think uh, what's different about all these devices is that uh, that companies have, have marketed the devices already directly to the consumer. These are all consumer facing devices, uh, especially these wearable ECGs. And so Patients are coming to us with their ECGs that detected by uh, on their Apple Watch or on their Cardia. And so we have to know how to interpret them and we have to develop the systems in place. So I think it's really on us to create those systems. Um, I think AI and machine learning will continue to improve and 
And certainly we're, we're doing work on this area where you know, AFib, AI detection of AFib will, will get better and better. Uh, but in the end, I, I think it's all, I think we all are reassured by being able to review the scripts themselves and make that decision on our own. And so I think to a certain degree, we all still need to want to look at the scripts and we have to have the systems in place to put, uh, allow for that. Dr. Quinn. Thanks, and yeah, Chris, great, great uh, overview of the, the current fields and, and where the technology is going, so thanks for that. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, echo Steve's concern about uh, the, the potential for a cascade of testing within these, these devices. I mean, we know that actually the, the, the algorithms themselves by the device manufacturers for saying this is AFib versus this is not AFib are actually pretty poor when you, when you uh, run them in the real world. So, you know, that they come up with sensitivities and specificities, which look great on paper, but even a high, even sensitivities and specificities in the, in the 90% range, when you plug it into a population of people where the actual the positive predictive value of, a, of a, a report of AFib depends not just on sensitivity and specificity, but the actual prevalence in the population. Mm -hmm. So as you know, if you, if you plug this in and you have patients under the age of 55 and you put in even Apple's own numbers, if it says it's AFib, the chances it's actually AFib are probably five to 10%. And even in the over 80s, the chances of it actually being AFib are probably at best 50 to 60%. So it does, it, it will generate a lot of downstream testing, which, you know, is obviously has costs involved. I think I would be, I'd be wary of prescribing anticoagulation based on a device report of AFib. Um, at the same time, they do provide great tracings and, you know, we've all made diagnoses based on cardiac tracings, Apple Watch tracings. So I think there's a lot of value to, to actually looking at the strips themselves. Uh, rather than relying on the, the device's report. And that was partly what they found in the, the cardiac surgery trial where they wore the watch and then the, the patients run continuous telemetry. The, the watch algorithms were pretty poor, but when a cardiologist looked at the strips from the watch, they were actually quite good at making the diagnoses there. And the other limitations, the second thing for, for this, this reported specificity of the devices depends very much on the, on the population that you tested in. So if you test your device on cardioversion patients, pre and post cardioversion, then pretty much every irregular rhythm is going to be AFib by definition. Whereas if you test it in the real world, you'll get a lot of irregular rhythms, which are PACs, PVCs, or noise. So you can sort of falsely inflate the specificity by testing only on AFib patients. So I think we just have to be a little bit wary of the, the, what the manufacturers are saying about their devices and actually look at some real world data. Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Quinn. I, I completely agree with you. I, I really, I don't think we should necessarily be using these patients, uh, these devices in, uh, in everybody. And I think, I, I think th that really goes to say that there are many unanswered questions in this space. That, and I think these are a lot of uh, points that you've highlighted in what you just talked about. Uh, I think, you know, these devices, I think we have to, as, a, as you mentioned earlier, they're often validated in the general population. But what we need to do is we need to run the studies to show that we can use these devices in targeted populations. And so specifically looking at those that are at high prevalence for uh, AFib. Um, so for example, patients post catheter ablation might be a very good population that uh, would benefit from using wearable devices, but not necessarily, and I agree that we shouldn't be uh, prescribing these patients the devices for everybody because you're gonna generate a lot of noise and a lot of, uh, a lot of alarm and anxiety uh, with if you just use these devices broadly. So I think that's, all, that's on us, I think, is to, is to really design the studies that will allow us to about use these devices in our high risk populations um, and, and thinking again, specifically at patients that have known atrial fibrillation and maybe using it as a way to tailor their treatment or, or to detect atrial fibrillation that occurs after catheter ablation. And so I think that's going to be where um, we need to kind of take the field uh, from, a research, uh, from a research perspective. And uh, I completely agree. I think you know your certainly your, your specificity and sensitivity um, uh, will will be will be relatively fixed, but your positive predictive value and your negative predictive value will vary substantially based on the underlying prevalence of the population that you're studying. Uh, and so, making sure that you choose a high prevalence population so you have that um, high positive predictive value. Thanks, and yeah, I think as you pointed out, like most of the people who buy these watches, uh, you know, if you look at any Apple store, the average age of the people standing around looking at products is probably like. 30. So we need to, yeah, use them in the, well, okay. <laughs> Dr. Murillo is showing his. Okay. You, you look 30 today, Carlos. There you go. <laughs> you know how I got mine? I got mine when I hit 2 million miles with Air Canada. They send me an Apple watch. <laughs> go figure. <laughs> Anyways, I'm, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we have Dr. Hill 
uh, with us today. And Dr. Hill is one of our eminent uh, stroke neurologists, and he's also the SCN lead for stroke and cardiovascular disease. And, you know, we have some limitations and monitors here in Alberta. So, Mike, any uh, further comments on this topic? Thanks, Carlos. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. Great, uh, great talk. And I enjoyed hearing about it, especially stuff about the MI post monitor. I didn't know much about that. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, we, we uh, in the stroke world, right, we, there's been this dominant theme that any any AF, uh, doesn't matter how long, um, needs to be anticoagulated post stroke and secondary prevention. And I, I think people are starting to, to reevaluate that and try to understand what it means, especially because with these monitors now we're we're picking up you know um short episodes of afib and of course the i think jeff healy first showed it right with a cert where you you know you find uh, afib after people have had a stroke not always before so the temporality issue of causation goes away i think we need to work it out i i really think the for the stroke world we need to understand what burden of afib implies a large enough risk that anticoagulation is warranted. And I, I don't think we know that answer exactly yet. So I'm hoping that uh, you guys will help us uh, help us sort it out. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I think uh, that's an important topic. I think burden is gonna be very important. Burden is gonna be very important for maybe even these post MI patients. Uh, Cause I am strongly into the idea that burden is what determines really mortality and actually progression to heart failure, for example. So we focus in those populations and actually intervene, we may actually have a bigger, uh, you know, buck for our, for our bang for our buck, because right now what it looks like, and you know, the studies you showed, there's huge population being screened, but very, very few people detected, mostly because it was the wrong population, you know, healthy people in their thirties, forties, that all have an Apple watch and are runners and whatever, you're not going to get a lot of AFib that makes a lot of difference in that population. Now is, are some of these markers, because it's not only about AFib, you know, we've had some data from Crystal AF and Embrace that it's also the burden of PACs. You know, can these devices also help us make like a combined score of burden of PACs, left atrial volume index, and some kind of a biomarker of atrial fibrosis that there's some candidates out there and have this little score of, of uh, not only the electrical and the, and the remodeling, but also a biomarker that would tell us, okay, this is a population that we definitely need to focus. Any thoughts on that? And uh, do you have any biomarkers in mind on these populations that you've uh, looked at? Uh, no, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, no, no particular biomarkers, but I think uh, I agree that there is evidence to suggest that PACs themselves um, are associated with risk, uh, and the PACs themselves are also associated with AFib. Um, uh, and so, you know, the other consideration that if you're monitoring patients for a very short period of time, or even for two to four weeks, it's still possible that you can miss um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that occurs more intermittently, and that PACs themselves may be a marker for that. Um, so I think what you said makes a lot of sense. We have to take into account all the all the findings that we, we find from these devices, um, perhaps to create some kind of risk score. Dr. Kavanaugh has the last question. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Wonderful talk. I was just wondering if anybody is looking at the rise in uh, device anxiety and device neurosis as compared to the detection of atrial fib, because there's some patients with these devices that I would like to uh, ban because uh, we're getting uh, recordings from them regularly, and we're also getting referrals for abnormalities detected on their watches. And these patients are taking recordings every hour or more. Mm -hmm. So is anybody looking at that aspect of things? Uh, I, I, I'm not, not that I'm aware of, but I, I think that's definitely something that we, we, need, to, we need to consider. And I think that's um, one unfortunate outcome of, of how a lot of these devices have, tar a lot of these uh, companies have marketed this as a consumer is that we, we get all these um, incidental findings that may have no clear significance and we need to have uh, a process to deal with that. I think that's where we have to probably work on, uh, on creating the evidence to shift the, the use of these devices towards more clinical indications and rather than just the worried well using the devices. Uh, and that's where the bulk of our work needs to be done uh, to shift the use of these devices to more clinically related indications. But uh, not that I'm aware of in terms of, in terms of anxiety and certainly something that a very important population as well. Thanks.
Okay, well, thanks, Chris. That was a fantastic presentation and great overview and I uh, look forward to chatting with you sometime later. Great, thanks, Dr. Mirlan. Thanks, thanks everyone.